Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last full day of Marfa. I will be your moderator today. My name is Sean Chang. I'm from Consensus Mesh, hailing from Brooklyn, but originally from California, so that explains why I am so welcome and happy. Um, I have the honor of being able to moderate a, a panel with such distinguished builders, uh, building in bears and bulls and experienced in not only seeing success in working with all sorts of collaborators, but also um, eating dirt and, and definitely not, uh, well familiar with failure as well. And so when we thought about what are, what are some of the, the types of topics and things that might be useful, um, we wanted to touch on some of the hardships of what it's like to build in this bear. And so hopefully today, because this audience is so well informed, um, we'll reach and touch some new ground. Each one of these individuals has done lots of podcasts and interviews in the past. So my hope is that maybe, maybe we touch uh, some new ground and, and new stories and, and things that uh, would allow for this audience to be filled with a little bit of inspiration to carry through, whether it's six months, uh, 16 months of, of this bear. Um, or further, right? Um, and, and hopefully leave with a sense of um, hope. So again, thank you so much for coming. We, we're going to start off with not introductions, like uh, I think a, lo a, lot of, a lot of the panels, I, I don't necessarily need to, I think, go through their backgrounds, but maybe we'll weave in a couple of pertinent elements of uh, what they've done historically and, and talk a little bit about um, what to do going forward. So we'll look back, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing right now in terms of artist tools, and then we'll go into the future. How's that sound? All right. Okay, so we've got a really challenging and difficult first question, and I'm gonna start with, how often do each of you think about the Roman Empire? Twice a week. <laughs> Twice a week. I got twice a week. Twice a week. Twice a week. Is it the roads? Is it? Is it? Is it? Uh, it's gladiators. Gladiators. So the gladiators in the re uh, in the arena. Uh, just no, no, no the, the, just the gladiator stuff. I'm, like the outfits. Yeah. The fashion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Helmets. Very cool. Uh, I would say. <sighs> Be honest. Honestly, every morning in the shower, <laughs> it's what, it, it helps get me ready for the day. Brushing my teeth in the mirror. I don't think about it very often. <laughs> I'm more concerned about like an asteroid coming through my windshield, like drilling into my forehead than the R Roman Empire. But yeah. and, and if you're not familiar with this meme, basically it's uh, significant others filming their, their spouses oftentimes saying, asking this question and then being fat, flabbergasted as to how often they're actually thinking about it. So to turn it back to something more relevant, what is the Roman Empire for builders in this space? Like, you can't get away from it. You're always thinking about it. Maybe it has to do with the bear right now, but what is something that is always top of mind that kind of uh, you go back to time and time again to inform how you're building something or how you're working with the space, but w what is the Roman Empire for generative art in, in Web3 for you guys? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty deep question. I think uh, one, one thing that I like to think about um, is the idea that a lot of artists become entrepreneurs. I mean, there's always been this like weird thing where like art, artists are not, you know, or business people are not creative and creative people are not business people, but all of a sudden you release your work of art into this crazy ecosystem on Twitter and Discord and like you're kind of marketing yourself, but like that's not why you came. You came to release art and you become an entrepreneur whether you like it or not. And you all of a sudden you're like beholden to people that you never thought that you'd be beholden to and you have the good comments and the bad comments. And so as we kind of navigate this space, like I always think about the idea that 
inevitably and it's accidental. Maybe I don't think anybody signed up for this initially when they released their work. Maybe by now they've released enough or we've released enough that you know that. But um, just kind of like the process that the artist is going through as they release work in this ecosystem, because it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's uh, even if you think you know what to expect, it's just a, there's always a surprise <laughs> around the corner. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think about that all the time as I think about how we kind of grow this ecosystem. These artists are now, um, part of this story and woven in and they have to deal, they wake up in the morning and think about the Roman empire, I guess as well, and how they're going to conquer their uh, madness that, that awaits them at Twitter. So yeah, or X. Justin or Chris. Yeah. Um, I actually don't think about the Roman empire that often, but on the spot, I can think of a couple of, uh, parallels. Um, Chris has me thinking about gladiators now. So I'm thinking, you know, as a gladiator in the ring, you kind of like, you live and die by your own skill. And then obviously the crowd, you know, filling that, that Colosseum is there to either support you or hate you, right? So I sort of think about it, I guess a real take would be as a founder, you live and die by your users, you know, whether you have users or not, and whether or not people find value in what you're building. And so I would say from a founder mindset, it's so, so important to understand your customer, understand your users, um, and ensure that what you're building is providing a lot of value. Um, I think it's kind of tricky though, because as an artist, um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that same sort of process of like building something or creating something to cater to a specific audience. I actually think it's better as an artist to just follow your heart and your passion and, and create something that you really believe in and then try to build your tribe and build your audience and your Colosseum crowd around that. So I think if you could find a balance between the two, then you could end up in a really, really great spot. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna butcher this, I know I am. I don't know, I'm not smart enough to put what I wanna say into words, so I'm just gonna do my best to string it together, but you'll have to bear with me. Um, first and foremost, like, I don't wanna give anybody in the room hope. Um, if anything, I wanna like give you fuel. Um, like hope is ephemeral and whatever, but fuel is different. Um, and some kind of piggybacking on what Eric said a minute ago, um, I think constantly about artists as enterprise. Um, and there's, and I know how hard it is to be a founder, particularly a solo founder, and that's exactly what creators are. You are, you are a business. I hate to, unless you're not commercializing your art anyway. Um, I didn't know how challenging that is. However, I think, what we think of as like, what, what is an artist? We have an opportunity today to kind of redefine what the mechanics of that look like. And so a digital creator or an artist or whatever it is in this world that we live in now, why not change the narrative about the, the infrastructure has changed, the art has changed, the delivery mechanisms have changed. So why are we not completely rethinking what it means to be a creator. And so there are more, that, you know, that is my Roman empire is like, how are we helping builders, creators grow horizontally to become more defensible and more successful? And so that's the stuff that both keeps me up at night and also like kicks me out of bed like I'm shot out of cannon in the morning, so. I mean, this is company number 12 for Chris from Transient Labs. I mean, give it, I mean, 12 you know, I mean, Chris, what's it like of, having 12 kids? I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I'm like, that's mind boggling. Mostly a failure, let's be very clear about. <laughs> but, but all by, if you look at the averages. Still, I mean, going through that process of idea and inception to actually sharing it with the world and the world judging it is, is very challenging. And so, uh, there's an author named Daniel Pink. He wrote a book called Drive. He talks about, intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. He talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so I wanna go back to, uh, maybe it's the 80s, maybe it's the 70s, five-year-old Chris, five-year-old Justin, five-year-old Eric. And I wanna reference, I wanna dig deep, I wanna know either a moment or a person that actually impacts and informs who you are today as a fully grown adult that's building and trying to build something of consequence in the world that you sometimes remember and think about that maybe that person doesn't even know. Maybe, maybe that 
you know, elementary school teacher or a moment on the playground or even at home? Was there a formative, positive or negative experience that fuels you so that it, it informs either the purpose aspect or the mastery aspect of, of what you do today? And feel free, yeah. any, any of you guys can start. Since I ended, I'll start and then maybe go the other direction. But um, and I didn't know this until much later in life and a ton of self-analysis and therapy, probably. Um, but I grew up in a household where my dad is uh, one of the best oboists in the world. The, anybody know what the oboe is? Can anybody like draw one right now? Like four people in the audience. There's like four people, yeah. It's a in very the- small world to be one of the best people in the world. Um, but so I, if you think about what an oboist does, outside of just performing, um, my dad's also one of the best reed makers in the world. And reed making is an art in itself. So I didn't know this when I was five, but I watched this guy ignore his family, ignore everything and make and toil, you know, hitting the same nail every day for hours and hours and hours and hours. Like I still hear the sound of a squawking, honking oboe. Just that's how you test reeds. You try to make them break and squeak and crack and like that just rings in my ears today. And I didn't know this, um, but I, you know, like you said, I'm you know, a bunch of companies in and I refused to quit. And I think part of that was, I just watched it. I watched somebody relentlessly create every day, make mistakes, throw the shit in the trash. I, he would have a f- trash can full of bamboo, like at the end of every day. So it was, I didn't know it at the time, but I think you know, 40 years later, it was a, un sort of known gift for me to watch someone uh, relentlessly try to refine their craft. Core memory, Justin, Eric, what do you got? Wow, that was, that was, that was a really good one. Um, yeah, thinking back to five-year-old me, um, I, <laughs> trying to picture it, Saturday morning cartoons. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I, I feel really grateful because I, I think I had a, a really privileged um, childhood growing up. Uh, and that's because I had a, a parent who was really always very present for me, always there for me. And that was my mom, who was a single working mother. Uh, my, my father actually was not present in my life from a very, very young age. And I don't really remember him at all. And so I think from a young age, she always instilled in me this um, importance to always try, <laughs> as corny as this may sound, uh, to, to try my hardest. And uh, I, I think, you know, because of that, I've always like had this very, very natural drive to want to be successful and make something of myself. Um, but she was also a social worker. And so she also instilled in me the importance of helping others and that there are so many people in the world that have, you know, had, have had it much worse than I have. And so I think those, those things have, is really what led me to where I am today, where uh, I really want to build something that's bigger than myself, but I really want to help other people. And to me, I think there's no better feeling in the world than being able to help someone else succeed. And so, yeah, that, that's been a really core thing about now where I am today with Mona and why we've built this platform that helps 3D artists uh, you know, build immersive experiences, launch them, become their own independent creators. Um, that's really why, uh, and it's, it's going back to being able to, uh, you know, help other people. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that would probably be, yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, I guess for me, when I was five, I didn't speak English. Uh, I moved to the United States kind of like in my fifth year, maybe I was six. And, um, so i I always felt like an outsider and I had this like very, I remember just being young and not feeling, I mean. I mean, specifically in class, someone one day was like, hey, you should say this word, and I'm not going to say this word in this audience, but um, it was a very bad word, you know, and then it, it, the whole class laughed at me. Well, I mean, it's just not a word that a six-year-old should ever say. <laughs> but uh, that is something that kind of has always carried with me, is just this feeling of being an outsider, um, just a, a weirdo, and kind of always being in my own world. And that combined with the fact that my dad is like a, just the most entrepreneurial person in the world, 
Um, but a person that always went out of his way to make someone laugh and to smile or to like make them have a better day. And it was this tension between not being able to communicate and being in a, just moving to a new country and not knowing anything except for my parents. Uh, my dad also had a very terrible, uh, English accent. In fact, it's still not super great. Um, and the ability to kind of break down that barrier by just making somebody smile was so powerful from a very young age, whether it was like, Hey, you need to go order your food at McDonald's and, you know, make some kind of joke about me not being able to speak correctly. But there was this feeling of being an outsider. And then the way to tear that down is to make someone's day better. And that's something that's carried away, carried, you know, with me since, since that day. And, you know, I think my dad, cause he's got maybe some of the best attitude of anybody I've ever. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for all, all sharing those memories. I mean, we all know that building things is hard and it's going to take a lot more than just a desire to be rich or to be famous or to be impactful or, or to have significance after death. And so making these decisions in the midst of a bearable is, is, is challenging. And so uh, one last question um, around kind of the past. Uh, can you just talk about the moment that you made the internal decision to build the company that you're building? And so if uh, that, was it a phone call? Was it a, you woke up, you know, um, with a headache or you're in the shower, but think back to that moment where you're, where you thought, okay, well, um, things are about to change. Everything is about to change again. Walk us through that moment and help, help others that might be thinking about starting something uh, in, in the audience, uh, catalyze their moments. Anyone can this go. Way. I mean, yeah. Um, gosh, a lot led up to starting our plucks. Um, I think, I don't know if Takawa san is in the audience, but uh, he recently asked me to do a lecture uh, in Japan. Thank you. And uh, instead of asking me to talk about art blocks, uh, and I just, I, I've said this so many times, so many people, so I'm sorry if y'all have heard this, but he asked me to explain. He's like, we already know art blocks. Well, we want to know how art blocks existed. And I got to speak for a whole hour and dig really deep into how our box came to life. And uh, there was this moment, obviously, when I was claiming my CryptoPunks uh, that you guys may have heard of that like, is the moment that I was like, oh, our box can exist at a smart contract level. But um, there's 30 years of being a you know huge nerd for code and for making stuff and for pagers and peepers and colorful things that really kind of culminated uh, in not building our blocks, but having the conviction to do it after being told by many people that it would lead to no, to nowhere. Um, you know, even my most, uh, uh, active supporters, uh, you know, I don't know if Danny is in the audience and Pete is in the audience, you know, my brother, Daniel and, and our friend pixel Pete, they had email addresses at our blocks in 2018 and we would get together on Thursdays and, they were kind enough to let me just kind of go on and on and on and on about this thing. And I think I even wore them down over that time period. Um, but yeah, that was a, there was a moment where it just kind of all of these things came together and specifically, you know, I like to call out Pete cause I can't remember when this was, but it was in a, in a low moment at some point in the last like decade where, uh, he said to me, you know, one day all of these things that you're working on will come together into something special. And, um, it, it, it's, kind of what happened so yeah that advice from a friend is like i've had the same somebody that i care about and cares about me deeply say the same thing it's just watch things are just going to come together the way they're supposed to and that's like you're sitting there like no fucking, no it's not everything sucks like what are you talking about so it's just weird to have somebody with that sort of blind belief in what you, it's probably more about you though and not necessarily what you're building but i would um my entry to the space was weird, um, not necessarily crypto native. I was one of those people that got started and then lost everything and was like, screw this, this is a scam. And I just w left. Um, and then in my last venture, I was building companies in partnership with pe people of influence. Uh, it sounds real, this is not meant to be like, it sounds bad, but um, so I built a venture studio with a football player called Odell Beckham. And then a lot in the, at the time, the only thing people wanted to talk about was cartoon JPEGs and sponsorships. And here's, you know, we'll do 
cash deal and this and everything felt awful i was just like this is gross and i don't want to so we said no to everything and it was and it, i didn't make any friends um and, and, and so i felt very much like to, to go back to your point i felt like a tremendous outsider um in and around the space. Like, so I'm having conversations with all these people and projects and going like, ah, it doesn't fit to me as a builder. And after the, that company, you know, unfortunately didn't, didn't work for a lot of reasons, some of my own. Um, I, just, I just felt like, man, if I feel like an outsider, a guy who's relatively, relatively adept at like, entering a new space how in the world are we going to get other people on board like is my, how do i get my dad to buy a piece of digital art <laughs> it's impossible and so i started thinking about very deeply like how do we build platforms specifically for onboarding like and really driven by so one step back to the celebrity stuff was like the one thing we did in any of those relationships was we i forced collection strategies we had, you had to develop a thesis and then you had to implement against that thesis. That was my whole thing. And so I thought that was a smart idea. If you want to play in the space that you should know what you like, you should be able to articulate that. You should be, you should have some portfolio design. You should have a budget. You should execute against a plan. And no one did, at least what I saw was nobody did. So um, I started building again because I felt like not to get too personal here, but like, I felt like I blew it. I felt like I blew my life opportunity. Think about that. Like I'm a kid who comes from nowhere. And I had this opportunity to build companies with these people that are like I admired. And then I fucked it up. And, and I'm like, my, it's over. Like I'm, you know, I'm going to go get a job at, but I don't, wherever. Um, but I felt something very vibrant and rich about what was happening. Not the, bullishness of everything in 2021. And then a good friend, same as you said, I know these two guys and they don't know what they are and they need you. And I was like, I, okay. And he started talking about these two people that were doing dynamic smart contracts with one guy's art and one guy's solidity code. And I didn't even know what that meant at the time. So to then be introduced to these two guys, I had the first meeting um, and it just sounded like, hey, we don't really know what exactly we're gonna be. Um, and I saw it immediately. I have never, so my move into the space was catalyzed by two of the most talented people I've ever seen in my life. And I just decided that I was gonna take my being the founder guy, like the, the face on the stage, unfortunately, that's kind of where I sit right now, was unimportant that I wanted to build into those two people because I believe so much in what they were capable of. And that's like, that's when we became Transient Labs. And then three months into this, I looked at the guys and I was like, we should be building a product. This is to enable this kind of creation for any creator. Um, and that's paid off. Like we have uh, built an incredible business, and I think that the decision about leaning into those two individuals—Ben Strauss and Marco Pafis—if anybody doesn't know, um, best decision I've made in my life. Justin, what's your moment? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I, so I, I've been obsessed with art my entire life, and you know, for as, for as long as I can remember. And so professionally over the last 10 years, I've been uh, primarily a 3D artist and I've done a ton of freelance work for different clients, work with touring performing artists like Drake, Charlie XCX. Um, had the privilege of working at DreamWorks Animation on, on feature animated film. And then I, I started seeing this new medium come about called VR. It's funny, I, I remember being a kid going to like Disney Quest and playing with the VR headsets. I don't know if anyone was there. Would you you had to step into the, it was it was massive and it was it was nothing like what the quest is um but then it, it had this resurgence with uh with oculus and um you know one of my really good friends my best friend matt hurl actually started getting me into vr while i was at dreamworks anyway it was it became this medium that i started to explore personally and um you know i left dreamworks and, and started to work at a company called magic leap which uh, they are this ar startup building um not not vr but ar uh 
hardware where you can, if you're not familiar, it's a pair of glasses that lets you see and interact with really high quality immersive uh, objects and experiences that are overlaid and, and perfectly and seamlessly um, uh, combined with the real world. So I, I, I saw that as the real future, not always being closed off from, from these types of experiences, but actually being able to have experiences and interact with content and uh, artwork in a way that augments the world around you and is very contextual to your surroundings. So I, I became obsessed with this. Um, so I, I was at Magic Leap for a few years working on a, a project, a couple of projects, one of them on a team where uh, we were building this digital human that you could actually interact with and could understand and see your surroundings and respond to the things that you're doing and uh, the things you're doing with real world objects and it was crazy. Um, but then ultimately I, I left and started doing my own thing. Um, I got into creating these uh, AR lens experiences for social media for different clients. And I, I started to really see how users, uh, like how users would, would come to interact with AR on a day-to-day -day basis. Because a lot of it is very much, you know, big picture, long-term future. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, these are just experiments that I was running. But also for as long as I could remember, while I, I've had all of these jobs and working as a freelancer, I've always been obsessed with uh, like business podcasts. And I, I would, you know, I'd listen to as many of these, you know, entrepreneurial and startup podcasts that I, I could. And I always wanted to, to start my own business. And then it wasn't until 2021, at the very beginning of 2021, when I started to see a lot of the colleagues that I would work with at VFX studios um, and animation studios who were minting their work as NFTs. And I saw all of this amazing artwork being created and, and this whole notion just really, uh, uh, really took me over this, this idea that you can actually point to a digital asset and you can verify this person created it, this person now owns it. And everything just started to click for me with everything that I, I saw with virtual reality, with augmented reality, what the future is going to look like. And with blockchain being that just key, key piece to all of this. So um, I started playing around with this idea of a virtual, uh, uh, an immersive platform where creators could actually present their, their 3D work that is minted on chain. And I, I wasn't really satisfied uh, with a lot of the sort of metaverse platforms that were available at the time. And um, for a number of reasons, just as an artist and working with artists who really want to present their work in the best way and, and you know, 3D work that is really of the highest quality, just there, there wasn't a great platform for it. So that's what led me to start Mona with my, my great friend, Matt Hurl. We brought in another friend and uh, we got our start thanks to uh, the Tachyon program by Consensus Mesh. And so that is really, that, that was sort of our friend who told thanks us. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, yeah, subtle plug. But seriously, that, that was sort of our friend who told us, hey, you guys have something here. You should, you should pursue it. Um, so. I mean, the common denominator that I love about each one of your stories is that through like progress is made through these relational lines. And a lot of times, like as thoughtful founders, you, you're constantly chewing on these problems. And it's through either, you know, one-off relationships or a, a near and dear friend that you might have chewed on a problem with that came to a conclusion where you said, I can't stop thinking about this. I gotta go. I had to go. I had to go. So um, fast forward, we're gonna go to the present. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about creator tools. So if this whole group could be teleported into your team's product Kanban boards, and everybody's talking about force ranking, because I'm certain there's probably 100, 150 things that you would wanna build, but you can only build so much, and there's only so much time. So um, generative art obviously has uniqueness, there's variability, there's interactivity, there's all sorts of complexity that can be expressed using code. Uh, just to start, we, we could touch on a variety of those things. How do you decide, I guess, which thing to build um, is one, one way we could ask it, but I actually want to touch on something uh, around randomness because I think ran randomness is uh, directly correlated with uniqueness and, and creativity. So when you're talking about a beautiful tool like P5JS, or you're talking about other mediums, or you're talking about how things are stored, or the longevity or the interactivity with each piece that a, that a creator creates. Um, talk to us a little bit about what role does randomness play 
in your suite of tools and the things that you choose to prioritize. Because if your tool sets and your, and your companies are an expression of what artists can do to make themselves be seen or, or to say something, um, what role does randomness play in how you decide what to build next? Okay. okay. Um, ironic that we would talk about randomness for, because much of what we do is very rules based. Actually, much of what we all do is very rules based. So it's odd that randomness is such a connected character to this other very fixed um, point of view. Um, and I'll just, I'll use a completely different example than maybe the other two guys will share. Like, um, looking at all of the possible things that we can build is it, hard. Um, we're, I say this quite frequently, that we're building for a future that doesn't exist yet. And so 60, 70% of the time, I I'm, I'm, know I'm gonna be wrong. That kind of sucks, but it's also like how you get to the right thing. So we talk about um, small experiments with radical intent. So how do we do something small and fast and, and then give it to people and then have them tell us this sucks or this is awesome or with these five changes, it would be awesome. And so um, we think about innovation and the creation of new things is not marketing. It's not like, it's not a buzzy word. Innovation is a system and it's a system that you as creators can implement. If anybody wants to talk more about innovation engineering, that's how we live our lives. So um, this idea of randomness is kind of programmed. So we, just this week, I mentioned to a few of you that we shut the company down for a week um, and we went offline. And so we flew everybody in from around the world and then we spent five days building three products. We shipped in five days. So it was an absolute nightmare sprint. Um, 16, 18 hour days. Um, people were bleak and <laughs> bleary eyed at the end, but um, it allowed us to get out of our current roadmap and to actually explore these new territories that we're interested in. And so in terms of randomness, if you intentionally create space for that randomness to occur, I think uh, that's where some of that real magic is born. So I would encourage anybody here to like factor that kind of space into your creative process and I bet you'll find some cool shit. I'm still thinking about mine, to be honest. Um, it's a good one. Yeah, I think that was, I think that's really powerful. I love this idea of building for something that doesn't exist. Um, I feel like that's what this whole blockchain ecosystem is. And I feel like when we think about what we're doing, uh, we don't know, we're writing this playbook now. Nobody knows the rules. We're figuring it out as we go. And there's a layer of randomness there where it's like that line could just take any direction, just like with a generative artwork that line could take any direction. Um, and I think, you know, the most important part of that is just having conviction that while there is no line that's guaranteed to be successful, uh, you know, the more lines that we give for ourselves, the more pulls that we have, the more likely you are to be able to like hit something. Um, and it's hard because, you know, building is hard and uh, building in a bear is hard. Keeping morale up is hard. And, uh, but, you know, I guess maybe where, where the randomness comes in is if you would have told me three years ago that I'd be sitting on this stage, I would have been like, yeah, are you, like it wasn't even one of those paths. Like it wasn't even one of the lines that had even started being built yet. And I think there's something to say about that because we're here, we are here and this path has evolved and hundreds of people have descended upon Marfa, Texas uh, to explore this sense of randomness. Um, and, uh, you know, I just try to like keep thinking about the fact that we don't know what that path is yet. We have to do our best. We have to think as much as we can. We have to plan accordingly. We have to like hedge. We have to, you know, think about risk, but also this future doesn't exist yet. We really are just figuring it out as we go. And um, uh, we kind of need to let randomness play itself out just a little bit, I think too. And um, cause otherwise I think we, we try too hard to fit within a mold of an existing thing that doesn't, um, 
doesn't line up or resonate with like why I'm here personally, right? Like I'm here for this unknown. I'm here for this future. We're building it. We're changing people's lives, like meaningfully changing people's lives, not just artists, but collectors and like, um, and I'm here for it. And we just got to keep letting it, you know, manifest. I don't know. I, I have to ask a quick follow up. Just how wild is it that we, The thing, that, the thing that we have today is not the thing that is going to introduce billions of people to this. Does anybody here think the thing we have today is that? Getting closer. It, Provision. So, yeah. <laughs> Provision. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So we should take some like peace or whatever in that. Is that like we're not even doing the thing yet. We're just building the foundation for that thing to occur. So there's an opportunity for he people here, or I don't know, like, that's what I think about all the time. I say, we haven't found our killer app yet. We haven't found the killer application yet. And that like, to your point, like we need more threads. We need more people building. Like we need more threads to pull on. We need more stuff to fucking fall on its face and blow it up, burn a piece of software to the ground. Otherwise, like we're just gonna be sitting on the same thing, hoping that we just get more people into the same thing. And like, I know you care very much about like broadening the scope of like who's looking at us and who's paying attention, who's participating. And I just think that like, we've, we've got to keep throwing lines out. Lines or threads? Well, you said lines, I like lines. Like Lines are good. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of, if you're, if you're a founder, if you're starting your own, your own thing, your own project as an artist or your own company, you kind of, you really do have to set yourself up for any type of randomness to kind of set you onto that right path for success too. So it's a lot of it is just doing the work, having conviction in what you're building and then being prepared for someone or some entity or, or some movement, something to happen that can kind of like catalyze everything that you've been working towards. So um, I guess like a, a common way to say this is, is you know, building your own luck, right? Um, so I think it's, it's that a sense of that because the universe is random, everything, it's, it's all chaos and we're all just, we're trying to funnel it and make sense of it. Um, and as Chris and, and Eric are saying, you know, the thing that, uh, the, the thing, we're not, we're not there at that thing yet. And so, you know, I think we, we definitely need more, more threads, more lines, more people building, and we have to really create that own luck for, for that future that we're building towards. Uh, and all of, like, the fact that we're all sitting here is like, that's, you know, good, good. That's a thread. Would you mind, speaking of randomness, would you mind, uh, telling a quick story about uh, how I was asked if uh, I was your bouncer or your security and, and how I mean, roles and roles changed very quickly how, for like a very quick how, moment. How yeah. random is that? I think that story needs to be heard. Yeah. I mean, it was just now, it was amazing. Uh, he was following me in the building and the guy's like, Hey, is this your security? Your security guy? I was like, I was like, I don't know for that split second. I was like, do I need security? Like, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. I love those answers. I mean, being creative and these moments are, sorry, go ahead. What, 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 tell, them, tell them about the guy. Like, who was he? He was the 3 a.m. trucker dude that um, Steve had, Steve from uh, Glitch had just been wandering out at night a couple days ago and there was this gentleman that was just curious and he's a trucker, he's coming through. He's, uh, I just met him, he's an amazing artist. He just showed me his work and um, yeah, I mean, it's just, like if the whole point here is to increase this, to me, I see our job as founders, our job as artists and collectors to increase the surface area for people to participate in this ecosystem. And there was this moment there where I was given, given an opportunity to increase the surface area for people to participate in this ecosystem. And it happened like this and it was amazing. Oh, dude, he's right there. What's up, man? Raise your hand, yeah. And it's just like, you know, it all just kind of came together. So, yeah. Check out his work, he's great. Um, hopefully you catch him before he leaves because I think you're leaving today, yeah. But uh, yeah, anyways, that was a, it was a, yeah. Life just yeah. kind of throws, throws things at you. Yeah. I mean, engineering serendipity is such a beautiful thing and obviously these moments where we can see each of these opportunities as something to, to help grow our space. I think there is a pervasive thought of just like, let's just wait for the bull. And I think all three no. of you know so if we're not we just create it, we're, we have to create it. We're not, you can't wait. So I, I mean, good examples of this are going to new geographies. 
I love projects that are showing up in venues as the only Web3 project, talking about it starting from ground zero. This sounds like really hard and challenging, but we can't just sit around and wait that, and then just hope, right? That's not a good strategy. So I, I wanna ask, like, what are some of those proactive things to engineer that serendipity? How, how do we think about broadening the space and ensuring that more people, and the, and the tent is bigger, right? So that more people, not just a couple hundred people, but a couple hundred thousand people actually show up and are interested in using these things to actually take, take advantage of the benefits of, of what all this technology has to offer. I mean, I'll just say real quick, I remember when uh, I was doing projection wrapping stuff and um, I was invited to participate in a maker fair. And at the time, projection ma mapping um, was not something that people were doing a ton. And so uh, I was invited to participate in the city of Houston maker fair and it was uh, in Sugarland. I don't know, maybe 200 people discovered projection mapping that day. That level of grassroots conversation is just something that we don't have in this ecosystem because we are not presenting in maker fairs. And just that's just maker fair is just a really simple example of like an opportunity for us not to be the center of attention of blockchain Web3 generative, but to just be one of the people that participates in sharing what they're passionate about. And so I think that in increasing the surface area, for people to participate, lowering the barriers to entry for people to participate. Uh, part of that is isolating ourselves and just being one more of the hundreds of other makers, of the hundreds of other people that are participating in that trade show. Um, and we don't give ourselves room for that because we're busy and we're slammed. And you know, the idea of adding another conference to the conference circuit is, I mean, I just, I don't know. I feel very supportive of, from my wife, but like at, at some point it will end, right? And um, but like, but that but maybe that's not our job. Like maybe we create this maker fair, and you know this is where like our blocks engine is something that I find to be so powerful. It's if we if we came up with all of the ideas of what people could come to our blocks engine with. Um, that'd be a pretty boring world. Like creating a thing where all of the crazy people that have been told no for years about their idea of being stupid can now have a place to go do that and bring it to their maker fair and spread those lines out. Like we just, again, we don't give ourselves these opportunities. We don't give ourselves conversational uh, opportunities with the outside world. And so um, I guess, you know, to that point, like I just feel like we have these little tiny opportunities to start having conversations that are not within our ecosystem and it is on everybody's shoulders. Um, as founders, artists, collectors, team members, everybody has an opportunity to give a uh, $15 NFT at the white elephant gift of their Christmas party. Uh, in fact, I almost want to make that a responsibility um, <laughs> because you know, that, that, that those kinds of things get the conversation going. Um, and so, yeah, maybe make her fair this year. I don't know, Mara, maybe we could do make her fair. That'd be great. Um, and I encourage everybody to do the same. Like look what stitchables is doing and plottables, like embroidering stuff on demand in front of your eyes. Like that is amazing here because we're all pretty big nerds about that. That would be the coolest booth at a maker fair, at least for me as someone that is into these things. And that doesn't have to be cool for someone that's into generative art. Like you go to a maker fair with that, that has nothing to do with generative art, nothing to do with blockchain and you will blow people's minds and you will inspire them to do really fun stuff. And that's just one of the 50 or so people that are working with us. So, yeah. I, um, you inspired something in me there. Um, I don't know why I was just doing this dumb thing regularly on like Wednesdays. I would just say like, what, what do you need help with? We just post that. How can I help? And, but a couple of caveats can't re don't ask me for money. And then eventually I had to add on, like, don't ask me to get you on super rare. Um, those, those, it was always like those, those two are always the ones that I had to be like, come on you guys. Like, so, um, you know, as somebody who's started and failed and done a lot of weird things in life. Like I just felt like we walk around with these like insulated pools of, intellectual and connective property. Like if you want to talk to a VC, I have like a whole tracker database thing that I, <laughs> you know, may have had to manage to fund companies. I, if you want to talk to a former Olympian, but like, so, but extracting that information and using it in a way that's interesting is, or, or valuable is, is tough. Um, but what I, what I wanted to say was like outside of, this like thing I was doing Wednesdays. One of the questions was like, how do we get, how do we get more people involved? 
And I was, I tried to do this in real time. So I would re reply, the threads were like hundreds of replies and stuff. And one of the replies that I threw out there was like, if, okay, if you want me to add a thousand or 2,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 new people to the ecosystem, here's what I'd do. I would take Jordan's and, and Eric's heart and craft project and I would go to a, a foundation that makes national art grants and I would ask them to give me a million dollars, two million dollars, something like that. And then I'd put a 3D printer in public libraries that don't have them and then build a curriculum for kids to learn how to use 3D printers making heart and craft hearts. So done. Run these classes, get public libraries to activate their communities. We do not have to talk about these things being tokenized or on the blockchain, like lean, build into people's desire to build and create something. It's the Dan Pink's book. The thing I took about away from Dan Pink's book, it's not about mastery. It's not about what for me, it was like, it's the, it's the joy that you get from mastering something. And even if that means learning to print 12 cubes, paint them and assemble them together and then stick them on a wall, that, that is, there is such a moment in that. So that, that was like, why are, why isn't there more? We just, there's, this is permissionless, right? We should just be doing these things. So, um, or maybe that we should get somebody to give us a grant to go fund people going, do these things. So if anybody has ideas, then the other thing we need is venues like this to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I just to add to that, I think um, we have to really lean into how what what we're doing here, how it is different, and how it is better, and how it can actually help people um, and enrich their lives. Leaning into that is really, and continuing to do so is really what I think is is going to help increase that surface area, but also creating opportunities for people. Um, everyone here, you all have really amazing ideas. You have your own groups of friends um, who care about specific things. And so I think it, it really is about just taking action on those ideas and having that conviction to be able to go and follow it and try to build something that you and the people around you, you find value in and help them to grow that. And then it, it's, I think it's, it's up to us as well to create opportunities for others. Like this weekend is an opportunity. We're surrounded by so many people here who are, are building incredible things and creating incredible work and sharing these ideas. Um, so it's, it's thinking about how we can create more opportunities for others to also build these projects that can add value. Thank you for those answers, guys. We are going to land the plane. We've gone backwards. We're talk, we've talked a little bit about what we can do today. We're going to go into the future. And then the future will be a quick lightning round. So a couple sentences uh, on a couple key topics that I'm sure have come up over the last few months. So the first one, and we'll just go round robin really quickly, um, generative AI your thoughts and how you or your company or founders should think about maybe using uh, generative AI tools? I'll just say uh, the blockchain is an incredible tool. Generative AI or AI in general is an incredible tool. And we will use these tools to make even more art to an overabundance, but I don't think there's ever a point where there's too much art in the world. And so these people will continue to use these tools to make more things, better things, faster things. And how they differentiate themselves from each other is actually how they're going to, you know, rise as, as known in artists. Nice. Gen AI. Yeah, I agree. It's about acceleration. Um, it's not about replacing an artist, but helping that artist to create better work, more work that is more impactful. Um, specifically for what we're building is metaverse tooling and uh, tooling for 3D creators. So we're really looking forward to incorporating that into our SDKs and um, enabling 3D artists to be able to create at a faster pace and um, create more incredible work. Yep. And an, enabled, an enablement engine is the way I see it. And, um, and so embrace it because it can help you do all things faster. And um, so hope, I, don't, I don't think we have any idea what, what's ahead of us, but uh, hopefully we see this as a tool to make us all go better faster. That's great. Chris, we're going to go with you and go backwards. Alternate mediums. So audio, video, experiential, GIFs, text. What are the other alternate things in addition to image or fixed and static images that you think are most important for you and transient? And what are the ways that we should be thinking about other mediums? So a um, couple, couple sentences on, on what you think on, on alternate mediums. Um, I, I just... I want to see more horizontal distribution of your talent. So I want to less vertically specific, 
how do we how do we give you wider capabilities to do things, whether that's tools or generative AI or whatever? Um, and, and so that requires experimentation outside of potentially your traditional body of work. Um, but that's where we are right now, and I think that's how we're going to discover. I think we're going to see more of you in the next ten years that through your art have found intellectual property and have found things that are productizable given all the things these new tools are doing and bringing to the world. So um, yeah, I think we're, that, that, let's get, let's get fatter, wider, that's probably not, fatter's not right. Wider, wider distribution of our skill set. Justin, other mediums? Um, the future of the internet is immersive. I firmly believe the future is 3D. Uh, and so that's really our core, core to our mission at Mona is empowering and elevating 3D artists who are building immersive experiential works. Uh, these are immersive worlds, interactive experiences, 3D assets. Um, and I, I think as hardware gets better and better, as we look into the future of this, um, the future is, is built by artists and creators and developers. And so um, we're really seeking to empower those types of works. Beautiful. Um, I think the human medium is something that we kind of take for granted, but like the idea that a couple of years ago, everybody was talking between PFP to PFP and you could be anybody and nobody cared and you could be yourself. And I think that this ecosystem alongside the, all the Web3 stuff has created a group of people that were able to just express themselves in a way that they may not have in real life. They could be kinder. They could also be more evil, but like we were able to be ourselves and it has created a virgin canvas of communicating between all of us and it has created a place that uh, soaks up the artwork that is being built and being created by all of the talented people in the space. That is the perfect um, killer use case of this technology. Um, and uh, I think just exploring that canvas a little bit more and like letting humans be humans and um, you know, positive individuals. I think there's there's something there. This expression of individuality that we see through generative art and generative creation, um, I think, has really uh, demonstrated something really special. Even if you go down to a PFP, it is an individual digital thing, uh, and we are the canvas, we are the medium, and uh, you know, we can navigate how we how we work through that in the next couple of years. That's awesome. All right, last landing question, and then one one question from the audience. So, get your your uh, your question ready. Whoever shoots up their their arm will will get the question. But the last question I have for you guys: the year is twenty thirty. It's not that far away. <laughs> You've made it through the the next bull run. What are the things that you are saying about your company and and the and the team members? Uh, of how you have moved the space forward and are proud of, of, of what you've done and how you've spent that time. It, look, if we continue uh, changing people's lives, whether they're artists or collectors, um, uh, that's really all that's going to matter. That 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 will drive the financials to make you know these companies successful. That will drive the financials for the artists to be successful. That will even drive the financials for the collectors to be successful. And so yeah, I mean I think in that future, um, you know, just sticking to our plan, focusing, uh, and being able to look back and be like, yeah, like we had the right idea from the beginning. We could be wrong, um, but that's twenty thirty for me. Uh, is just kind of looking back and being like, yeah, we stuck with what we were doing and and uh, and along the way made some friends and changed some lives. Love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's it's. I guess for me uh, and for what we're doing at Mona, it's it's really very similar. It's um, how can, how can we help people? Uh, to me and for what we're doing is how can we help fill the world with really rich and beautiful immersive experiences. How can we help elevate artists and creators to transition to becoming full-time artists, perhaps, or even just being able to supplement their income so they can um, you know, start to make a living off of doing what they care about and, and pursuing their passion? Um, and yeah, 2030, not that far off. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about you know, what, what's going to look different in terms of the delivery mechanism for these different experiences, how we're connecting socially. But uh, for us, it's, it's really about um, what I'm excited about is, is helping to elevate those creators who are building immersive 3D works and you know, filling the world with eventually millions of these experiences that we can all share together. Take us home, Chris. Um, I would say I think our vision, not just mine personally, but um, we will have succeeded by then if 
if we have built something that supports the entire life cycle of a digital object. That's the platform that we're trying to build. We believe that these objects are going to be far more distributed than they are today. And network objects distributed widely is an incredible place to be. Um, yet, today the infrastructure is bifurcated and broken and siloed and philosophical and you can't do, you know, you're either a manifold or a transient person. That's, I vehemently disagree with that. Um, these are all tools. And I hope that, that we've created a thing that provides the underpinning of the life cycle of these really important digital objects as we move forward. I love that. All right, one question. Anyone have one question? Has to be a good question or we're just going to end it. I knew you guys look bored, but damn. Not, oh, okay, thank we you. got one right here. Historically, people think of builders as coders or engineers, but personally myself, that, that's not me. Can you guys talk about some of the builders you've worked with who weren't as technical, but still had really meaningful contributions? Me, like not, not. Code Academy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, the, the, the technology, especially given the things that are being created right now, becomes less and less, uh, that skill become, is still a skill and will always be a skill. Um, but there are more enablement vehicles to help you get better at that. Um, but building, particularly if like, know what your magic you know, thing is, um, like I know mine, I know how to construct something and tell people about it. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you the first thing about diagnosing a bug in our solidity code. <laughs> and not the first thing. <laughs> um, in fact, so little that we had to do transient trivia. Uh, in our like week long thing this week about like just so that we all knew all of the things that our stuff does. And so um, I would encourage you to, uh, particularly if you're non-technical, um, lean into someone technical, uh, but ultimately like do what you're best at and just do that thing. Yeah, completely agree. 3D artists here. I mean, um, I think the important thing though is you have to understand uh, how do, if you don't, ha if, you, if you're not technical and you don't have someone who is really technical to work with you, then you have to be able to um, be willing to learn enough to get you to that next stage where you can then start getting traction, getting users. Um, and I, I would say more importantly than being a really, really strong coder um, is, is being able to know how to assemble all the pieces and put things together and assemble people as well. If, if you want it bad enough, you will become technical also, if that's the only way, if that's the only way, you know, like I spent a lot of time trying to build art blocks explaining to people what I wanted and it was a disaster. And the only way that I could do it is becoming technical, learning Node, React, all of these things and building it myself. And so it, there is a point where you may just have to and just know that the satisfaction it's like the satisfaction of, you know, you buy a 3D printer, it comes disassembled, you assemble it and it breaks and you're like, oh, I know what's wrong with it because I assembled it. Like that is more satisfying than the 3D printing itself sometimes. And I would say that's pretty technical, but the world has made it so easy for us to be technical. AI, YouTube, it's just, it's all at our fingertips. You know, we can have a full laser cutting, embroidery, 3D printing, ceramic studio in the, in the footprint of like one of these panels. And you know, like life has made it easier for us to do that. Yeah, there's educational tools everywhere. Shout out to Skillshare, shout out, shout out to Code Academy. Interestingly, co-founders of those companies are of Web3 companies now. So Ryan Babinski, who helped to create Code Academy, is the co-founder of Decrypt now. And Malcolm Ong, who helped to find, found Skillshare, is the founder of a, a, an NFT project called Terminal 3 now. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. So can everybody please give a big round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Eric, for sharing so much. Appreciate it. Those are hard questions, man. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.